you will receive a link uh, later on uh, where you can download the uh, recording if you need to uh, review anything. Um, so who am I? Well, my name's uh, Alistair Chapman, as I'm sure you're aware. And um, the, over the years, I've been working in broadcast TV across most genres from uh, broadcast TV doing motorsports and motor racing, Formula One, things like that, World Rally Championship, through to corporate videos, the uh, kids TV, uh, cinema commercials, and all kinds of things. So I have a very broad uh, range of experience across a lot of different genres. I'm a Sony ICE, that's an independent certified expert. Um, I don't actually work for Sony, I'm not a Sony employee, but I do do a lot of stuff for Sony and I do get paid for that stuff, so um, I, you know, they do pay me to do a lot of stuff. Um, I'm a blogger, a writer and a trainer and I run the website xdcamuser.com which is probably how you've heard about these seminars. Um, so let's uh, start to um, get into the, into the session properly. Um, questions. There is a question box where you can type in and ask questions and I'd be more than happy to take questions at any point during the seminar. So if there's anything that's unclear, anything you'd like me to clarify or go over in more depth, please do um, type in a question and I'll uh, try to answer as many questions as I can um, during the, the session as we go along. Uh, yes, like that indeed. So there you go. So somebody's found the question box. Um, a little bit of a disclaimer. So while I always endeavor to give accurate and reliable information, I cannot be held responsible for errors. I'm only human. Uh, I try my best to make sure that everything that I write about and talk about is 100% accurate. But sometimes errors do crop in. I may be given incorrect information um, from other sources. Um, so they do happen from time to time. I apologize when they do. If they do, I will always try and post a correction. Um, video production is a creative craft and any advice that I give is based either on industry best practice or my own personal experience. You know, we're, we're painting pictures here and you know, different people will have different views on what is good, what is nice, what is pretty, what is not. So uh, there will often be different ways of achieving the same results and what I consider best may not be everyone else's idea of best, but I do my best to give a balanced view uh, where I can. Um, so high dynamic range and what it means to you. So in this session, we're going to look at, first of all, what high dynamic range and HDR is. And there's a few things that people get wrong about it. Um, and then go on to talking, looking at some of the things you need to understand about uh, EOTFs. Nice fancy word, I'll explain that as we go along. And uh, then what it means to you from a practical point of view in terms of shooting and post-production. So. Uh, we've covered that. Over the years I've shot many, many different things um, from storms and hurricanes, the northern lights, to drama and all kinds of things. And what I have to say really is that almost everything that I've shot would benefit from being shown now in HDR. Now HDR is one of the first times that my wife has ever, when I've got a new TV in, has arrived at home, looked at the picture and looked at the content being shown on it and gone, wow, that was worth the investment. So HDR really is a strikingly different uh, thing to what we've had in the past. And it really is important that you get your head around this as early as you can, because it's going to be coming at us very quickly and very fast. And in fact, it's already here, as we'll see uh, as we go on through the session. So what is all the fuss about? Well, for basically since the beginning of television, we've had this limitation in display technology that's limited what we can show on a TV screen or a display. We've had cameras now for a, a number of years, 10 years or more, that can shoot with dynamic ranges that far exceed what we can show on a TV screen. So your typical standard dynamic range, SDR TV at home, will have a range of about six stops. And that is actually the TV standard we currently use is called REC 709, the HD TV standard, allows for a six stop display range. And very often people will also shoot with six stops in their video camera. So quite often you might have your camera set to REC 709. So the camera is going to capture six stops, maybe a little bit more. Then that gets um, squeezed into a little 8-bit signal that is broadcast to the home and then it's displayed on your TV. Now if you're capturing six stops and displaying six stops, uh, contrary to what this slide here shows, this was uh, stolen from Sony, um, 
the contrast that you get on your display will actually match the contrast of what you've shot. Six stops in, six stops out, everything should look the same. But the problem is that the real world is very, very rarely just six stops. Now, something else just to say at this point is that when we are talking about HDR, we are not talking about that horrible photographic technique where you take multiple exposures at different um, exposure points, combine them to create something that doesn't look real. Because the whole point of SDR, uh, sorry, of HDR, is to create something that looks as real as possible. And the real world, uh, even today, so here in the UK right now where I am, it's quite overcast. Outside, as looking at it earlier, we have a dynamic range of about eight or nine stops. So with an SDR standard dynamic range TV, we can't really show that. Now, to get a bigger dynamic range than six stops of captured dynamic range, what video cameras have often done is included something called the knee or a highlight roll-off. And the way that works is it takes the highlights of the image beyond the six stops that Rec. 709 allows for and takes them and compresses them into a very small range to give the impression of information that is brighter than six stops. So you'll be able to see clouds in, in the sky and things like that, really bright stuff, but it doesn't look real. It's compressed, it has its low contrast, it's quite flat. I and mean, when you look at the sky in the real world, it's normally very, very bright. But when you look at the sky on a typical standard dynamic range TV, it's not particularly bright. It's actually not much brighter than uh, white, a white piece of paper. So the limitations that we currently have are not in the cameras. The cameras can capture big dynamic ranges but are in the transmission that we're currently for terrestrial broadcasting and over-the-air broadcasting using only 8 bits, 235 luminance shades, which isn't very much, and in the display technology, which is historically been very limited, limited to six stops. But that is now all changing. So uh, right now, one of the things that we can do is you can go to your TV store in your high street and you can buy an HDR TV and the HDR TV can show a bigger dynamic range. But at the moment, very few people are distributing HDR content. So you don't really get a great deal of benefit because the content isn't there in the mainstream at the moment. It is available, it is out there, but certainly not with BBC and, and people like that. Um, we still have this problem with 8-bit transmission as well. But that, if you are a broadcaster that is sending your picture over the internet or over the web, what we call over the top, as opposed to over the air, OTT, a lot of those limitations go away. The first one that you can eliminate very easily is this weak 8-bit transmission uh, link, because if you're sending stuff over the internet, there really isn't anything stopping you from using 10-bit or even 12-bit. And HEVC, H265 codec, new codec, can actually do 10-bit in a file size or a bit rate lower than current 8-bit 8 8 H264. So that limitation really has gone away. And that means that it is now possible to take the output from a camera shooting, let's say, in 10-bit log, transmit that log signal, and potentially show it on a screen so the contrast is correct. And potentially we could have 14 stops of capture, 14 stops of transmission, and 14 stops of display. So that is what HDR actually is, or the aim of HDR is, is to capture the real world with a brightness range that is true to life and realistic, to then encode and transmit that true to life signal, and display that true to life signal in a true to life way with a corresponding dynamic range on the TV on the screen. And that would then give you HDR. Um, something a lot of people don't actually realize is if you take S-Log and you can show it on an HDR display that has S-Log as the gamma, it just looks right. It no longer looks flat, it's nice and contrasty, and it all looks correct. So in simple terms, um, so sorry, yes, I haven't, got, I haven't got to that bit, I'm running ahead of myself slightly. So as well as the dynamic range, which is the brightness range of the picture though, we now have cameras that can capture a much wider color range or color gamut, and we also have better display technologies, better than cathode ray tubes, that can also show a much wider color gamut. So as well as the brightness range, 
what we're really talking about when we talk about HDR is not just a bigger brightness range but also a larger color range on this diagram here the large oval the outside bit represents the visible spectrum what we can see with our own eyes then you have the smaller yellow triangle which is the current REC 709 TV standard and then the black triangle this larger one which is REC 2020 now REC 2020 could be described I guess as a current standard it exists now and you can use it now but really REC 2020 there's a clue in its name is meant to be something that we switch over to in the year 2020 and if the EBU had its way and SMPT had it had its way that actually turn off 709 in 2020 and insist that everyone uses REC 2020. But frankly, that isn't going to happen because of backwards compatibility and legacy issues with all the millions and billions of TVs that are already out there in the market. So we're not just talking about brightness, but also about color. And what we have to think about color is as a volume. And this diagram here represents REC 709. At the bottom is black. And as we go up in height is our brightness, is our luminance range. And you can see with REC 709, it only goes to 100 nits. Uh, so that's the brightness of your average um, TV at home. And um, then you have to the left, you have green. To the right, you have red. And coming towards us, you have blue. And that's REC 709. If you think of it as a three-dimensional volume, it's not actually very big because what we're looking at with 2020 is this. So we're looking at a much greater brightness range and a much bigger color volume as well. Now, um, one of the uh, things that, uh, I've just got a question popped up. Um, yes, color volume, you can have a thousand nits uh, in REC 709. Yes, somebody has pointed that out and that is very true. You can have uh, REC 709 at a thousand nits. Uh, you could also have REC 2020 at um, REC 2020 color at 100 nits. So there's lots and lots of variations of what you can actually have. But I think what we are actually really looking for overall is to um, have a bigger gamut. So, so I'll ask for some more clarification on this. So increase the color volume of 709. Well, no, you don't. So if we had um, REC 709 HDR, what you would have, or so pure with high um, dynamic range, REC 709, you'd have basically the, um, let me go back a slide, you'd have this um, size, width of color, but it would be much taller. So you could potentially have this going all the way up to a thousand nits or even more if you wanted. So it would become taller. And what you're, you're looking at really the same uh, color range, but with a greater luminance volume um, but with HDR we can increase both the color range so we can expand the color range out as well as up when we increase the dynamic range um, so there's lots of um, things to consider so, so when we go outwards we get richer uh, deeper more intense colors when we go upwards we get brighter colors so REC 709 we can have brighter colors with a higher dynamic range but they are not richer, they're just brighter. If we go to 2020, we can have richer, more saturated colors, either at standard dynamic range of 100 nits or at 1,000 or even 10,000 nits. So it is a, a volumetric thing. So you go up, it becomes brighter, you go out, it becomes more saturated. Um, so uh, that, that's kind of try, trying to explain how that works. Okay, so Basically, the crux of the whole thing is, though, that HDR brings you brighter highlights. Uh, I don't really agree with this slide. This is from, from Sony, so it says deeper blacks and richer colors. Now, certainly brighter highlights and certainly richer colors. Now, deeper blacks, arguably that's incorrect because black is black. If something is black, how can it be any blacker? It can't. Black is black. So you ideally go from black to your new, higher, brighter contrast. Now, what the slide here is actually implying is it's actually really talking about the display technology. Modern displays can show much better blacks than they could in the past. Now, in terms of what we're capturing and recording, black is black. The question then becomes, can the display that you've got display a true black? 
And that's actually one of the very hard things to do. Currently, OLED is the best technology for displaying blacks, but there is new LCD technology that um, is just coming to the market now that can display blacks that are almost as good as OLED and in very, very small areas, so it's very high resolution as well. So this is all, all coming and um, you know, it's all, all good stuff really or quite an exciting time to be a cinematographer. Now Sony have done a little simulation here. This is this image represents standard dynamic range and then this represents high dynamic range. But of course you're probably watching this on a regular computer screen or maybe a high quality monitor. I doubt very much it's HDR so this is just a representation of what HDR means. You really need to see HDR to fully appreciate it, to fully understand it. As another example here, just to give you an idea, and I, I, I quite like this example, um, here we have a shot, uh, it's a clip that I shot recently of a lightning bolt, and on a standard dynamic range TV, uh, white is going to be shown if the TV is calibrated at 100 nits, and black and the deepest shadows, well, they will be black. So we go from black to 100 nits, black to white, and that's your standard dynamic range. Um, it's worth noting actually most modern TVs actually go quite a bit brighter than that. They probably go to two or three hundred nits, a good quality uh, standard dynamic range TV. Um, and we'll come on to, to that and some of the problems that that perhaps creates in a bit. Um, but white is white, whether it's HDR or SDR. Now this is an important concept to get and this is something, something that people perhaps don't really understand. So the whole idea with SDR and HDR is white is white. White is white. If you are looking at a white piece of paper, it's white. And that white piece of paper is roughly five stops above black. Um, if you go down from white in stops, um, you'll get to black after about five stops. So black to white is five stops. So white is always going to be the same amount brighter than black or your deepest shadows. Now what HDR does is it doesn't make white brighter it makes things that are brighter than white, or at least it allows you to show things that are brighter than white, much, much brighter. So looking at this example here, we have some uh, white, whitish clouds, and then you have a bolt of lightning coming out of the clouds. And that bolt of lightning is barely any brighter than the white of the clouds. Because with standard dynamic range, if my white is at 90%, my bolt of lightning is at 100%, um, it's barely any brighter, it's one stop brighter, that's it, and it's not representative of the way the world really is, because we all know that lightning is much, much brighter than white, it's brilliantly white. So I've got another slide here uh, to give you an idea of what we're talking about. So we go to HDR, and now we can show the lightning much, much brighter. I'm kind of cheating here, because actually my white isn't white. So the idea is that you know, when you go to an HDR TV, you show that bolt of lightning on the HDR monitor and it's brilliantly white. It is so much brighter than white that it actually now looks like a bolt of lightning rather than a white line drawn down the TV screen. So standard dynamic range, high dynamic range. That kind of gives you an idea of what we're talking about, but on a much more extreme level. With an HDR monitor, you're talking of five or six stops brighter than white. Um, with a uh, high-end HDR monitor. Okay, so why all the interest? Well, ultimately it comes down to money and it more than anything else comes down to TV manufacturers wanting to make more money by selling us all nice new shiny HDR TVs. And it's actually quite an easy sell for them. Going from HD to 4K was quite, it's quite a difficult sell. You go into a TV showroom, you see a whole bunch of TVs there, you've got some really good HD ones showing some great HD pictures, and next to that it may be a 4K one of a similar size, quite possibly only showing an HD picture, but even if it's got 4K top content on it, it's not going to look radically different to the HD TV, unless you're very close to it or it's a very big screen. It's going to look similar. Yes, the 4K is better, I'm, you know, with a decent TV, 4K looks great, but it's not a huge step up from HD, and a lot of people are perfectly happy with the resolution of HD, so why bother buying a 4K TV? But 
if you then add HDR to that TV and extend the dynamic range so that highlights are brilliantly bright, lightning flashes off the screen, suddenly you have a TV that looks hugely different to the HD TVs and looks really, really good and can show images in a way that we haven't seen them previously. Because really for the first time, we can actually see images on a TV screen that mimic the real world when you have a high contrast situation. So sunny days, sunsets, thunderstorms, all of those things can now be shown the way they actually look to the human eye. So this is a big, big change and a decent HDR TV next to a standard dynamic range TV, SDR TV, it is a night and day difference. It's not a, oh, maybe I can see the difference, maybe I can see a bit more resolution. It really is that big a difference. And a lot of the stuff that we need to do HDR, we already have. So we're going to get more lifelike pictures. We already have cameras in widespread use that are capturing high dynamic range. And basically high dynamic range, we're talking about anything greater than about 10 or 11 stops. So even a lowly old EX1 capturing 11 stops will benefit from HDR being shown on an HDR screen. So especially when you go to the 14 SOP cameras, so uh, Alexas, the Sonys, the Reds, and all of these cameras, you know, we've been shooting with them now for a number of years. People are sitting on big libraries of content or at least original rushes that are already high dynamic range. There's already the tools to grade it, and there's already the ways of mastering it and delivering it. The workflows exist and the TVs exist. Live trials have been completed. It's all in place and it's all happening right now and it's happening very, very quickly. So, well, cameras are in widespread use and we have Netflix, Hulu and Amazon already delivering over the top OTT, that's over the web, content in HDR. So if you have an HDR TV and you directly connect it to the internet and you go onto Netflix, and if I take an example of here, Marco Polo, and you download that, Netflix has a little chat with the TV. The TV says, hi, Netflix, I'm HDR. And Netflix says, oh, that's cool. And if your internet bandwidth is big enough, it will send you an HDR 4K stream. And I can tell you, it looks stunning. I'm really blown away with the quality of the images I'm now getting on my TV at home. It's way better than anything that I get off any of the terrestrial broadcasters or satellite broadcasters right now. I am lucky. I do have a 150 megabit internet connection here, so I have no problem with bandwidth. Um, so that, that really does help. But um, the, one of the great things actually about HDR is that it doesn't actually require more bandwidth than 4K. So the HDR that's currently being delivered is 4K. It doesn't, make any, doesn't need any more bandwidth to deliver it because the codec, the encoding, is actually the same. It's the same compression as used for the regular uh, 4K at the moment. Uh, in the future, it probably will improve. We'll probably go to, to um, 10 or 12 bit, but right now, it's still a really good image, um, but it's still within the same size of file as we currently have for 4K, and you can actually do HDR with HD. And I think that's something very important to note is that HDR is not limited to 4K, and we'll see some of the research that the BBC are doing in a minute uh, on that. So we can already get HDR content to the home. What about our production workflow? So our cameras are capturing 14 stops when we're shooting in RAW, or we're shooting with log, whether that's S-log or log C or whatever. And, and I'm not just saying this because this is a, because of the stuff I do for Sony. Right now, the standard monitor for grading of HDR, the one that almost everyone is using, is Sony's BVM-X300. And this is a 1000 nit OLED 4K monitor that has not just high dynamic range, not just high contrast range, but also very, very wide color gamut. This is the monitor that everyone currently refers to. It's approved by Dolby for Dolby PQ workflow and that tends to be what everyone is using. So we have the monitors for grading. You can grade using Resolve and things like that. But the key is to understanding the different EOTFs and OETFs in terms of your delivery and grading.
Now, EOTF and OETF, I, I just love the way that these terms have suddenly appeared from nowhere and everyone's going, oh yes, you must have the right EOTF and OETF and it makes everyone sound really impressive and, and big because you're using these fancy terms. Whereas actually, EOTF and OETF, what is it? Gamma curve. It's the same thing. It really is. It's just a fancy way of saying gamma curve. So there's lots of different curves now for HDR and this is where there is a whole world of confusion. The standards exist but there's lots of them and it hasn't really settled down just yet. So let's have a look at ST2084 first of all. This is the gamma curve or EOTF used for Dolby Vision. It's based around a theoretical 10,000 nit display and that's a serious display range. I mean that really is probably completely unrealistic display range. It would be so incredibly bright that in most living rooms, in most viewing conditions, it would probably be uncomfortable to watch. Um, the EOTF, this is the one used for Dolby Vision, and obviously it gives us a bigger luminance range, but it has very specific brightness mapping. It's called a perceptual quantizer. Quantizer is um, compression or, or squeezing something into a certain range, and perceptual is based on uh, the uh, display more than anything else. So it's all about what it looks like on the display. Now white, as I've mentioned before, is set at 100 nits as per standard dynamic range. Everything above white and 100 nits would be considered a highlight. In the real world, if you think about it, a white piece of paper is going to be, if you look around the room that you're sitting in now, other than the computer screen, which is a source of light, the brightest thing in the room might be your walls, which might be white, or it might be a piece of paper, which is white. There's nothing going to be brighter than white, unless it's actually a direct source of light, maybe your computer screen, maybe a window, or um, a highlight or a specular reflection. So anything brighter than white is considered a highlight. Um, different curves are needed for different peak display brightness levels. And this is one of the problems with this curve, ST2084. Um, every time you have a brighter monitor, let, let's, st let's say we uh, were grading and we decided to, to try and grade ST2084 for a 10,000 nit display. Well, we've shot with 14 stops. We could map that to our 10,000 nit display. And on this theoretical doesn't exist 10,000 nit display, it would look fantastic. That bolt of lightning or whatever would be brilliantly bright. But then you watch it on let's say Sony X300, which is a thousand nits. Well, the problem you're going to have is everything above a thousand nits, so between a thousand and ten thousand, is going to be clipped off. The screen can't show it. So when you're grading with ST2084, you need to know the target brightness range. You need to know what the audience will be viewing the, the curve with, because you don't want to grade for 10,000 nits if it's only going to be watched on a thousand nit. And right now, there are TVs on the market claiming to be HDR that are only 500 nits. 500 nits is a couple of stops above our standard dynamic range, um, or what you can get with a decent SDR TV. So it is HDR, but it's, a, it's kind of just HDR. Even the better HDR TVs out there right now are only about 800 nits. So you want to, if you were grading for 800 nits, it's going to look great on an 800 nit TV. But then on a thousand nit TV, it's kind of a waste because you're never going to get the peak brightness. And this is the problem with this particular curve, is it's very specific, specific brightness ranges. In addition, it doesn't compensate for ambient light levels. And one of the problems that we have is that in the average home, uh, people tend to go and crank up the brightness on their TVs because they're not sitting in a dark and perfect viewing environment. Most of the time they're in their living rooms during the day. So they crank up the brightness on the TV to compensate, and that would screw up any calibration. So ST2084 has some problems um, for a domestic viewing environment. It needs 10 bits, really. Um, ideally, it should be 12 bit. If you go less than 10 bits, you will suffer from banding and quantization. And actually, this is one of the problems with HDR. HDR is very unforgiving of poorly shot footage because it will show up any flaws in the footage much more readily 
if you think about it, if you shoot with a camera and you have a load of highlights that you've captured, you go into post-production and you squash them all together for standard dynamic range, that will hide a lot of problems in the footage. But with HDR, you're going to see those highlights properly. Any problems there are going to show up. A um, bit more on ST2048. So white is 100 nits. Most consumers exceed 100 nits, typically 3 to 400 already in standard dynamic range, and people um, raise that TV brightness. And PQ, ST204, it's the same curve, doesn't allow for this. Um, these are the brightness values um, for ST2084. Um, there are some Dolby monitors that are, are brighter than the X300, and in fact at NAB, Sony was showing a prototype TV that had a 4000 nit display, and it looks stunning. And in fact, they've just released the consumer version of that TV, uh, uh, I think it was a week and a half ago, and I think, it, if I remember right, it's about £4,000 for the smaller one, something like that, $6,000, $7,000, something like that, and it really is a stunning TV. I don't think the consumer version is 4,000 nits, though. One of the problems we have with HDR is that there's a lot of regulation around the world as to the power consumption of TVs. I know in California and the USA, they are very restricted, and here in Europe, they're very restricted. A TV can only consume a certain amount of power per screen size. And as you go up um, in brightness, obviously you need more power. So TV manufacturers are having to find ways of working around this to, to have a brighter, higher dynamic range screen, but without consuming any more power. And this is one of the challenges of HDR right now, with, um, especially when you're getting to the very bright, you know, sort of 4,000 nit displays. Um, so ST204, so something that came up earlier was actually, and a question I've been asked is, what does it look like on a regular TV? So oh, I do actually have some slides for that. So this is um, a shot that I, I shot recently, a storm at sunset, Rec 709, plain vanilla grade, and that's what it would look like in Rec 709. And this is what would happen if we were to view the same thing in ST2084, um, and this was graded for 2000, a theoretical 2000 nit display. So actually, as you can see, if anyone's shot with log, with log C, with S log or anything like that, it looks remarkably like log. And actually that's because it isn't actually that dissimilar to S log. It's actually quite similar in many respects to S log. So if you try and view uh, ST2084 or PQ directly on a standard dynamic range TV, that's what it will look like. It won't look great. It'll be re really flat and really washed out. So that means that you have to do, if you are a broadcaster, you have to have an HDR version and an SDR version of your content if you want to use ST2084 or PQ. So the BBC, meanwhile, have been working on this hybrid log gamma. Now, hybrid log gamma is designed to get around that limitation. Developed by the BBC and NHK, who have been looking at, well, how can we improve the image that people are watching at home today without having to change all our transmitters or anything else? And they've developed this log gamma curve, hybrid log gamma, that allows you to uh, send an HDR image in basically a standard dynamic range backwards compatible way. And it uh, has a theoretical maximum of 5,000 nits, which is much lower than the 10,000 nits of ST2084, but I actually think this is a much more realistic high-end limit. Um, having seen 4,000 nits on a large screen, I would even wonder if that's too bright for a lot of viewing environments. So 5,000 nits does seem a realistic, to me at least, maximum for uh, HDR. The EOTF, or gamma curve, is adjusted depending on light levels. So in the TV, and Almost all the TV, well, in fact, I think now it's a legal requirement that televisions sold now have a light sensor in them that measures the ambient light, the idea being that at night and in the evening, the screen is darkened to save on power and to reduce the power consumption. So hybrid log gamma takes advantage of that sensor and actually adjusts itself in the TV. So the gamma curve in the TV actually adjusts itself to match the ambient light levels. So that means that you're actually going to get, it, it sounds like you're going to get a less consistent picture, but the reality is that you get a more consistent viewing experience because as the ambient light levels go up and down, the decoding of the, of the gamma is adjusted so that what you see on the screen appears to have the same brightness and contrast range. So you actually get a much more consistent viewing experience, which is good. Um, now, 
what you could consider hybrid log gamma as being similar to is something like a hyper gamma or a cine gamma. So in the Sony cameras, you have these gamma curves that can capture more than six stops of 709. And they do that by having the lower end of the range from black to around about 60%, which is in your skin tone sort of area, is more or less Rec. 709. And then the highlights are heavily compressed with a highlight roll off. And hybrid log gamma is a little similar to that in that the below about 60%, it's very, very close to 709. So that the mid-tones and darker parts of the picture will look more or less correct on a standard TV. And then on an SDR, standard dynamic range TV, you get these compressed highlights, a little bit like a hypergamma or cine gamma would look like. Meanwhile, if you have a hybrid log gamma television HDR TV, it can take those highlights and expand them back out to get the higher dynamic range. So I've got some um, examples of some hybrid log gamma here. So this is hybrid log gamma, it's that same storm clip in hybrid log gamma. And you can see that it doesn't look unreasonable. I, when I did this grab, I actually made a slight mistake because this is hybrid log gamma with Rec 2020 color. So the colors are slightly off because you're probably looking at it in 709. So if we go to the 709, so that's 709. Um, what you can see with the 709, of course, you see much brighter sky on the left because that's reaching peak white and everything else. And you can actually see how in 709 you have the clipping problems and on the left side and color banding where the dynamic range is limited by 709. When we see the hybrid log gamma version, it's a little flatter, but you can actually see the highlight roll off over here. You can see how it's rolling off into the highlights a bit better. So this is going to be potentially, I think, a really interesting way forwards um, to go because it means that you can sh have one signal that you transmit or broadcast hybrid log gamma and it's going to be viewable on a standard dynamic range TV and look perfectly acceptable and if you have an HDR TV with hybrid log gamma it's going to look really really good because you'll get the high dynamic range benefits. Um, so that's a bit about the curves or quite a lot about the curves actually but what about shooting for HDR? Well I've been effectively and shooting content ready for HDR for about five years now. If you're shooting with log, S-Log3, 16-bit RAW, Log-C, uh, uh, Canon's log, whatever, if you're capturing more than 12 stops of dynamic range, you're basically capturing HDR ready material, or material that can be converted at least to HDR. Quality is paramount though, because HDR, as I've said, is very unforgiving of poor image quality. So you want to record using S-Log or 16-bit RAW or something like that. You really do need to expose very well. Remember, the shadows are the same for SDR and HDR. Black is black. So it's very important that you get those shadows right. Don't think that, well, if I underexpose a little bit, it's going to give me more room for bigger highlights so the HDR will look better. The reality of the moment is that displays that currently exist, most don't go much above eight, maybe 10 stops, really good ones, perhaps 11 stops of display range. So if you're capturing 14 stops, you're still capturing more than you can ever show. So your highlights are still going to be limited in display. So you really do need to expose well to keep those shadows looking good. So don't expose darker to gain better highlights. The mid range is still the most important part of your image. That's where the viewer is going to notice any problems. If your skin tones are noisy, if your faces are in the shadows, things like that, people will notice that. If your highlights are a little bit off, well, most people won't notice that even with HDR. So expose nice and bright, expose basically the same way as you do now when you're shooting with log, which is brightly to get the best signal to noise ratio. The more light you can get onto your sensor, the better the signal to noise ratio. Don't stress about your highlights. Don't constantly panic. Oh God, am I clipping? Am I clipping? If you're shooting in log or raw, there's so much data in the brighter parts of the picture, the little bit of clipping really isn't going to hurt you. So shoot nice and bright. Um, there's no highlight roll off with S-Log3. It just goes all the way up into clipping and there's as much data in that brightest stop as any other. So make use of those brighter stops by exposing brightly. Um, now one workflow that um, is being suggested by Sony is to actually um, shoot grade and produce an S-Log3 master because from S-Log3 of course you can convert 
to various HDR standards. So let's look at real world HDR post-production. Um, it's really important to retain the full range of your captured images. You need to capture it to, to keep it through your workflow. So uh, while Adobe Premiere and things like that, they have included HDR options in the latest versions of Adobe Premiere, I would really recommend that you go into a dedicated grading package to do your finishing. You will get a better result. Um, you're likely to produce, going to be necessary to produce multiple versions for TV, cinema, and streaming. Now, um, often when we talk about HDR, I think people tend to focus on high-end, high-quality productions, and certainly there's a very big place for HDR at the high end. But also consider this, corporate videos. Let's say a company that you're doing a corporate video for makes uh, paint for cars. Now cars, shiny cars, look much better in HDR. You get those lovely reflections off the bodywork and things like that. You want to do a really impressive video that they can show in the reception of their corporate headquarters. You get an HDR TV in that reception and you shoot in HDR and it looks stunning. It will look absolutely fantastic. So it's not just something for high-end um, dramas and movies. There is very much uh, a market for HDR at the corporate level um, for, for certain types of production. Um, but very often though you will need to produce multiple versions. So let's say you're doing that corporate video, you might have to do a 7.0 nine version as well as an HDR version. So you want some sort of grading package that will allow you to do multiple versions. S-Log3 or Aries Log C for that matter could be used as a mastering format, just a, not just a recording format. The one thing you won't want is to end up with your master in 709 because if your master is a 709 master it's very very difficult to make it into HDR. In fact you, you can't basically. So when you finish your production and you're going to save that master, if you save it as S-Log3 or ARRI log c you can then export from S-Log3 or, or most of the other log curves to the various flavors of hybrid log gamma, uh, ST2084 or 2709. So better to save your final master as S-Log unless you're saving multiple versions. Um, LUTs or converters are used then to convert from that master, your S-Log or whatever, type of log you've decided on to your final output version and you can use a tool such as LUTCALC. I'm just going to drop out of my um, presentation for a minute. Um, this is LUTCALC. If you haven't seen this before, you can put in your um, recording gamma or your master gamma here and you can see I've got this set up for S-Log3 and S-Gamma3 and then you can set your output gamma here so I could do a lookup table for PQ if I wanted to produce a PQ version or I could then switch to hybrid log gamma to do a hybrid log gamma version and I can create lookup tables that I could export to my grading package to go from that S-Log3 master to my HDR uh, versions um, as well I could also of course do uh, Rec 709 um, here as well, so we could do Rec 709 as well. So really, really good tool, that's LUTCALC by uh, Ben Turley, um, and there's Mac and PC versions of this software, and it's really low cost, and everyone should have that in their toolkit. Um, so back to the slides. Okay, and we just, where were we? Okay, right, so LUTCALC. Then um, post-production workflow and how you're going to do it. So if you don't use um, LUTCALC, uh, the other way to do it is to use software that can produce multiple versions. And uh, there, there appears to be a slide missing from my deck right now. Um, one way of doing that is to use some sort of color management settings such as ACES. So um, if you use ACES and you edit and grade using ACES, uh, everything inside ACES is done to a set standard, it's linear, so that's really, really good for HDR, and then you can output in different standards. You can output 709, you can output in DCI-P3, and you can output in HDR, so you can make multiple versions that way by setting the output uh, options on ACES. Or this is another way of doing it, if you don't want to use ACES, this is DaVinci Resolve and their color management settings, and in this particular project, it's set to DaVinci Y um, RGB color managed and then if you go into the color management page of the setup you can actually choose 
different output options. And you can see here that this is set up to output in REC 2020 and uh, ST2084 2000 nits. I wouldn't normally use 2000 nits at the moment. I'm tending to do most stuff at 1000 nits because that's the most compatible. Um, and again, you have options here for hybrid log gamma and all sorts of other things. So this is another way of doing it within DaVinci Resolve. Um, it sounds very complicated. It isn't. It's just a case of setting up your project slightly differently. Instead of just using the vanilla DaVinci YRGB, you use the color managed ones, and then that allows you to have multiple output options instead of just being tied into Rec. 709. Um, so yeah, there we go. It gives you the ability to do output in different ways. So your workflow was going to look something like this. So you shoot with your raw or your log, you grade it, composite it, and you do your HDR finishing. Then you produce a production master, which would be an S-Log3 or something like that. Um, S-Log3 or Arilog c depending on your, your favorites. And then you would convert either via LUTs or a hardware converter from the S-Log3 to your HDR version, maybe ST2084, a hybrid log gamma version as well, perhaps. And you could also, of course, do a Rec. 709 version. So by having that production master as S-Log3 or an, a similar log curve, um, you have lots and lots of options to convert to different standards. Now, what about monitoring and looking at all of this stuff? Um, just one more bit here. There is the link down there. Uh, like I said, I will. Um, you'll get an email um, of the recording of this presentation later, so you'll be able to go back and uh, get that link if you want to go and uh, get luck out for yourself. Um, what about monitoring? So, on a budget, not all of us um, have big budgets. Not all of us can afford the beautiful Sony BVMX 300. I would love, love, love to have one of those monitors. Absolutely stunning piece of kit. So most of us have to work on a small budget. And I've just finished a project grading a load of storm footage, and I've done it in my home edit suite using this, the Atomos Flame. And you know what? It's done a really fabulous job for me. It has the Atom HDR function, and it has the PQ EOTF in there, and you can set the brightness range. And I actually set it up to match the Sony X300 did a whole bunch of grading using this. It's a little bit small, I wish it was bigger, um, as my monitor. And I then took it into Sony's uh, facility at Pinewood and we looked at the grade on the X300. And you know what? It was pretty much spot on. We made a few very minor tweaks here and there, but that was just because we could more than anything else. Um, really impressed with how well this really low cost piece of kit works. Is it perfect? No, it's not. Let's face it, this is an LCD screen. They are doing some very clever stuff with that LCD to, to get HDR from it. It's 1,500 nits is its peak brightness, so it's really, really bright. Um, they're doing some really, really clever things. It's not perfect, but my, my, for the money, you can get a really great result from it. And, um, you know, I really you know, can't say enough about it for HDR. I also used it on location for checking my footage. Um, when I was shooting, it has S-Log, uh, the S-Log2, S-Log3 curves in it, and you can monitor those in HDR. So you can actually see on the screen what you're actually capturing. And I tell you what, it's such a revelation these days to actually be able to see you know, something that's, it's not quite the full range that you're capturing, but it's damned close, uh, rather than having to look at some horrible viral Rec. 709 approximation of what you're capturing. It really, really is transforming the way I shoot and everything else. Now, there are other monitors from other manufacturers as well, um, from Small HD in particular. Small HD have a very nice range of um, HDR monitors coming out, but of course, with this, it's also a record. It's a very versatile tool and piece of kit. So, you know, it gets my vote, certainly. And it is remarkably accurate and it has 2020 color, or at least it gives you the right um, uh, color range so you can use it for 2020 grading. What about using an HDR TV for uh, monitoring when you're grading your HDR content? Well, I would be extremely careful. I do have an HDR TV, and to be honest, as a grading tool, it's it's very so-so. There's lots of variables. I'm not entirely sure 
what the dynamic range of it is. I think it's about 600 nits. I'm not absolutely sure. Um, there's lots of auto enhancement functions going on in the background. TVs, what they're, what they're trying to do is make the picture look as good as possible all the time. They're not trying to show you the picture as it is. They're trying to make it look good. And you don't want that. You want to see your pictures warts and all. Having said that, though, it is an idea, and I think it's something that I'm investigating even more. My HDR TV is in the house. I need to get one for the edit suite as well. So I can have a large screen HDR TV alongside my higher quality calibrated HDR monitor as well. So you can do it, but at the moment, there's lots of vari variation between the curves that's in these TVs and things like that. So, yeah, but I, I think I'd prefer to get something like the. Um, the Shogun Flame or something like that. Um, talking of the Atomos devices, I was reminded just before I started the presentation, there's a firmware release, I think it came out yesterday, for the uh, Ninja and the older devices that don't have the 1400 nit screens, and they now have some HDR capability as well. Uh, I think is it 500 nits, I believe, something like that, that they go up to. It's certainly a big improvement over the standard range and gets you in the right direction. That's 400 nits, I've been corrected. Um, gets you going in the right direction. So, um, you know, it's and it's free. So go grab those updates if you've got the older recorders. It certainly uh, gives you a, a great extra couple, two or three stops of range on your screen, and it's really going to help you, especially if you're shooting with log and things like that. Um, and I've got all sorts of stuff. <laughs> um, so, yep, yeah, and there's be another firmware update later in the week for the Ninja Blade, I'm being told. So Atomos are working frantically behind the scenes to, to, to try and make HDR as easy as possible for everybody. And that's really great because it really is going to revolutionize the way we do TV. If you get a chance, if you haven't seen it, go and see some HDR. Go to IBC. And, and look at all the HDR that will be shown there. I can guarantee you it will be the big thing at IBC. It's what everyone will be talking about. Um, remember, image quality is not just about any one single factor. Image quality is about many things. It's about color. It's about resolution. It's about dynamic range, uh, contrast, sharpness, noise. All of those things come together. And we have now finally, after all these years of shooting electronically, come to the point where the images that we can capture and display are really quite remarkable and I think genuinely, genuinely rival or possibly even exceed film. I was lucky enough to um, uh, spend some time with Vittorio Storato, Storaro, um, who did Apocalypse Now and quite a, you know, a few films. He's just done the new uh, Cafe Society with Woody Allen uh, while I was in the States last time. And it was really fascinating talking to him and he opened my eyes actually quite a bit to the way we use color today because we have this Hollywood look now that's become very popular and everything has this uh, brown and teal and you know, we're creating this contrast between skin tones and this teal tone and watching a lot of films lately and they all look the same and actually they're all really dull because they all look the same it's just become this I actually, I'm getting really quite fed up with it now, this look that is just almost formulaic. And it's boring. And Cafe Society, you really should go and, and see it because uh, Cafe Society looks stunning. It's rich. It's vibrant. It's vivid. The use of colour is gorgeous. Um, and I think we've forgotten how to do that, um, perhaps because the cameras weren't very good at doing it. And the TV screens weren't very good at showing it. But now we have these amazing cameras and the ability to show incredible and amazing colors as well. We really should use it. I mean, look how vibrant and vivid The Wizard of Oz was when that came out. We've kind of, I think we've kind of gone a bit backwards and, and, and everything with color and use like that. So really great to have these exciting tools right here, right now, even Sony's little FS5. You know, you can capture 14 stops of dynamic range of that, record it. Um, I'll go on, I'll give you a plug, Lewis, I know you're listening. Record it raw on your Atomos product. Um, lots and lots of dynamic range, great for grading and post-production. Then you can view it in HDR and it is just going to look fabulous. Yes, okay, FS5, um, same as the F5, FS7. They don't have that huge color range, perhaps, that the F55 can deliver you, but they're most of the way there and it's going to look great if you do it properly and you handle it properly. Really exciting time to be a cinematographer.
So really that's pretty much everything that I wanted to cover in this session. Um, if you're lucky enough to have an HDR TV, make sure you are um, all set up for Netflix because they do have great HDR content on there and it does look fabulous. I've got a couple more minutes. I'll just sit here and wait a couple of moments, see if any questions come in last minute. It doesn't look like there are going to be any. I hope you have found the session useful. Um, if you like this session, please tell your friends, tell your mates. I am hoping to try and run these on a regular, perhaps monthly basis, to do one day a month where I run a whole diff uh, host of different uh, webinars on different subjects and topics and hopefully bring in some guest speakers and things like that. Um, but it will depend on getting some sponsorship to do that. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see what we can do. Um, 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 so actually I have a question, uh, oh, all questions have come flooding in suddenly. Okay, so what do we lose with our F5? Is it important to upgrade to the F55? And that is a good question. Um, let me just um, backtrack a little bit on some slides here. Uh, where's the one I want? Let me just go back to this one. So, and there's a lot of debate and a lot of discussion about this. Um, the difference between, and we're talking purely about colour gamut, between 709 and 2020. Now, 2020 is obviously bigger. If you look at the diagram, you can see you're going to have richer reds, not much difference in blues, and richer greens. Now, in the real world, how many colours are outside of Rec 709? Well, actually, in the natural world, not that many, to be honest. In the natural world, most colors fall within 709. It's very rare to have colors beyond that because you are talking about really intense, vivid colors. They tend to be man-made colors. Uh, a, a good example of a color outside of Rec 709 is the fluorescent um, yellow jackets that, that construction workers wear and things like that. 2020 will re represent that much better than 709 will. Um, the one thing 709 is a bit weak on is brown, is uh, rich browns. 709 doesn't show very well. So going from the F5 to an F55, yes, it, it is going to be better, um, absolutely, but it's going to depend on what you're shooting. Um, if you're shooting natural history and things like that, I don't think that actually there's a lot of difference, to be honest. Um, the 55 does have there's something about the image that is a little bit nicer, but is it worth the extra? I'm not convinced, personally. I have an F5, I love the pictures I get from my F5, I know I can grade it and get great results, and the same with the FS7 and the FS5 and those cameras. The colours off those cameras have never really disappointed me. The F5 is better, um, but is it $10,000 better? I'm not sure. If, if you're going to do a lot of HDR day in, day out, uh, yeah, perhaps you'd want to buy it, but I wouldn't stress over it. I wouldn't panic. It, your, your F5 is not suddenly become um, obsolete or anything else. Um, could the FS5 internal 4K 8-bit be good enough for decent HDR grading? Oh, that's a good question. Um, not really. Um, I think would have to be my answer there. You are struggling with 8-bit to get a decent S. UHD, it's pushing it um, as it is already. Oops, didn't want that slide. It's, it, it is pushing it already just to get a decent you know, 709 picture when you take the 14 stops and you squeeze it down to 709. You can do it. You're going to have to get your exposure absolutely spot on. And that's going to be why it's not bright stop in. more vibrant, you actually see more contrast in the picture, and as a result, the picture looks sharper, and as a result, any noises in the picture tends to stand out a bit more. That's a bit of a side effect with uh, HDR. So FS5, borderline. You, you want to get the Atomos recorder on the back of there, you record RAW, take the 12-bit RAW out uh, into the Atomos, it's going to be much, much better for, um, for, for HDR work. Um, somebody's comment is awesome for sci-fi. Yes, indeed. Um, explosions. Exp one of the, another great thing in HR, explosions. They, they are brilliant. They're bright. They light up. It has so much more shock uh, effect when you have an explosion that really makes you, your eyes squint as it happens, as opposed to just being 
an orange blob on the screen or something like that. Um, so there you go. That's uh, I think all the questions. Oh God, even more questions. Um, 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 uh, so somebody's missed the beginning. Uh, there'll be a recording of this. You'll get an email with the recording uh, to the link. And somebody's complaining they're losing sound. Uh, I apologise about that. Um, so really run out of time. I have to prepare for the next um, seminar it's a little bit later on, which is uh, questions and answers on the FS5, FS7, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Thank you very much for tuning in. You will get that link to the recording uh, later on or tomorrow at the latest. I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you found it useful, and I'll catch you again some other time. Cheers, guys. Bye bye.